2020, the year the world fell in love with 3D printing again. So my name's Tyler, and your name? Tate Brown. Mr. Tate Brown. And we're on the 3D printing team at Go Engineer. And you're listening to this because you're interested in knowing what's new, primarily in SOLIDWORKS 2021, which is being released this upcoming month. Now, us on the 3D printing side, we have the advantage of having new stuff happen to us and be released all year long. So when it comes time where it's October and November and everyone's excited for what's new in SOLIDWORKS, we've had a whole year of what's new. So we thought for our content, we would take some time to reflect on some of the happenings in the 3D printing world this year, particularly with the COVID-19 pandemic and some of the implications that it has had on our industry and our customers. So real brief to give a little bit of background, I started in the 3D printing industry here at Go Engineer in 2010. And prior to that, I had some 3D printing experience, but not so much. So my experience is mostly rooted in the commercial side of the industry. Yeah. Uh, for me, I started 3D printing in high school, uh, got one really early on, got our hands on it. Didn't really even know anything about manufacturing. So got my hands on at that machine early and then through college. So it was just being adopted kind of as I grew up. And then moved into oil and gas and used it as a prototyping tool. So um, my experience is mainly with functional parts and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, so Tate's experience is more on the on the user side, I would say. And this is now, probably now a good time to mention, we're doing this in podcast format. So Tate and I are just having <laughs> a conversation about this, about this topic here. Surprise. Big surprise. And we're not doing this because we're out of time. Just FYI. <laughs> so... I thought this topic would be pertinent and interesting, but in order to discuss how incredibly impactful 2020 has been for 3D printing, I think it requires some background information on the history of 3D printing, primarily over the last 10 to 12 years, I would say, uh, to, in order to understand the context of what's happening in 2020. So I'm going to start by uh, giving the history as I know it and, and my experiences. And uh, we'll touch on what it means for the industry now and moving forward. So many of you may be aware, but 3D printing in general, as a form of manufacturing, first emerged in the 1980s. You do have some groups like I think there's a Japanese group and a French group who were investigating methods of building up shapes layer by layer in the late 70s. But there are really three influential people who emerged in the 1980s as the first pioneers of commercial 3D printing or 3D printing in a form that was actually patented and commercialized. So you have uh, a man by the name of Chuck Hole who invented stereolithography uh, using UV cured photopolymers. And he went on to start a company called 3D Systems, which is a company that we're well aware of still today. You also have a guy named Carl Decker, who is credited with inventing SLS, or Selective Laser Sintering. And he actually did that while transitioning from an undergrad to a graduate student and later a PhD student. And his first 3D printing efforts were in metal, actually, SLS metal. Wait a second, hold on. So <laughs> do you know the first three pre presidents of the United States just offhand? <laughs> George Washington, John Adams, and I don't know. That surprises me. I figured you'd have known. I used to know. Okay. <laughs> but, hey. And you got two for uh, three. Okay. James Madison. I, you may have gotten it. Did I get I it? I knew the first two. Nope. Nope. Yeah. That's number did, four. That didn't sound right. Okay. Number three, Thomas Jefferson. Oh, oh sorry. Okay. okay. Yeah. Back to it. I just, <laughs> for everyone out there, this guy's a whiz. I just, I just wanted you to know that. So 
there. Now they know you're not just he's not looking at a book when he says this stuff. He he knows his history. He's freehanding this. <laughs> All right, continue. All right. Well, I actually have the privilege of having met two of these three people. And I have a picture with those two people at the same time. It's cool. That is cool. Yeah. So you have Carl Decker. And his idea was commercialized. He formed a company called Nova Corporation that eventually became a company called DT, which some people say it stood for desktop manufacturing. Some people say it stood for Deckard, Texas, and the third name. But it doesn't matter because <laughs> it didn't mean either one of those, apparently. So DTM. And he's still around. And uh, last but not least, you have Scott Crump. And Scott Crump invented Fuse Deposition Modeling, or FDM, and formed the company Stratasys, who we work with day in, day out. Stratasys products here at Home. So you have those three pioneers, and their goal was commercial level printing, and they had grand visions of businesses and organizations using 3D printing to create parts, uh, functional, viable parts. And we're going to skip through the 90s, most of the 2000s, all the way up to like 2000. You have, like, you have this time period between 2006 and 2008 where uh, a professor by the name of Adrian Boyer started the RepRap <laughs> project. <laughs> and RepRap was the world's first open source 3D printing project. And he was capitalizing on some patents uh, originally granted to Scott Crump and Stratasys around the FDM type of 3D printing. So the extrusion of thermoplastic materials. And uh, Professor Boyer's goal was to create a tool that could self-replicate or mostly self Print its own components. Print its own components, yeah. And um, 2005. 2005 is when it started. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But um, January 2009 is when MakerBot emerges. And that's when things really start getting interesting because MakerBot takes the open source movement and commercializes it into a product geared towards consumer. And MakerBot's decision to do that maybe not so popular at the time, especially amongst the people there in the RepRap community, it really set off the next decade of 3D printing development. So enter what I have come to know, the hype curve. Hype curve is something that... Is this your term or the world's term? I didn't, I didn't invent this term. <laughs> this is a term that I learned about in probably 2013 or 2014. You had some people who are much smarter than me in the 3D printing community understanding where they were at in history. And they were telling the rest of us, we're in the hype curve, right? We've been listening and we've been watching what's been happening since 2009 to 2014, and we're following the hype curve. Do you have it? The hype, the hype cycle. The hype cycle, yeah. Here we go. And yeah. I would recommend Googling it. The hype cycle. Yeah, so you have the technology trigger, which causes this steep incline, and then it peaks at the inflated expectations. Then it drops into a trough of disillusionment, mm -hmm. and then starts to slowly climb to about the midpoint at the slope of enlightenment, and then plateaus at the plateau of productivity. And so, yeah, it's a pretty... Self-explanatory so curve and definition. Have, having learned about this, could you guess where we are right now, 3D printing-wise? Um, I would say we're at the slope of enlightenment. Um, on the upward trend. Personally, yeah, that's where I'd say we're at. I feel, well, other times it feels like we're, at, <laughs> we're in the trough of disillusionment. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it just depends on how you want to look at it. The trough of disillusionment is sort of this area where you're trying to reconcile, reconcile like what you've been told something can do and the reality that you're facing that maybe you can't do it and your brain hurts, doesn't like it, right? For sure. I, yeah, I find myself doing that often. <laughs> <laughs> so these guys were pretty smart to recognize that this is what we were going through at the time. So this period between 2009 and 2014, was wild. I was just entering the 3D printing space and 
I was in learning mode and very quickly I was in teaching mode because everyone else was in learning mode as well. And it was exciting because we would hold these events at our offices and you would have 50, 100 people showing up and they weren't just designers and engineers. They were also analysts and investors trying to understand what is this 3D printing thing? What can it do? And what do they want it to do? I definitely attribute some of the hype and some of the exaggeration. Inflated expectation. Yeah, inflated expectation to these outsiders who are not very technologically savvy, per se, Mm -hmm. and have this vision of 3D printers being in every household the same way other, like your coffee maker. Is yeah. in your house. <laughs> and but instead of making coffee, you're gonna be making pizza slices and other <laughs> other things, you know? I feel I feel like this curve sometimes happens in a single sitting <laughs> <laughs> with certain people. Yeah. Like when oh you work for Stratasys or you work for Go Engineer? Uh, well, tell me about it. And you tell them that you you work with 3D printers and they're like, oh my gosh, so you can do this and that yeah. and they have all these, and then you walk them through the realities, and you kind of see this curve happen in real time. So, probably because they've been primed already to believe some of those things, right? Sure. Through like pop culture, music videos, television, movies, you're seeing this technology happen in real life, or like what you, is portrayed as real life, but it's not. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> There's people out there. I remember when I first started working here, I was sent to a college locally um, to kind of talk about our products. And it was a 3D printing convention. And there's people printing. uh, They've got bio printers they're working on. And, you know, they're printing the real deal. You know, say I'm printing a human ear, right? It looks like an ear because it's all this cellular buildup in the shape of an ear. But does it function like an ear? Is it an ear? Eh, you know. Right. And then we come out with the digital anatomy printer, which we'll probably talk about a little later. But yeah. uh, it's it's printing human-like anatomy that looks very, very realistic, acts very realistic, but it's not real. And again, getting back to this curve, you have people like, oh, I saw a real beating heart that was 3D printed mm-hmm. somewhere. It's like... Mm-hmm. That's not what we're doing. That's not what we're doing. But, it, you know, who knows? It's the future. It, it could happen. That's the thing. is, if You go back and look at photos of some of those first parts that Carl Decker printed on his undergraduate printer project. They look terrible. But, <laughs> but now you have 787s and A380s and um, rockets flying into outer space with 3D printed metal components on them. And so they all start out at that bare minimum. And even then, back in the 80s and the early 90s, and basically every day from then up till now, people have thought it could do something that it couldn't do. And those, in to give them credit, those are the people that push the technology into arenas where suddenly it is doing something where we didn't realize it was doing, you know? For sure. Like in that early part of the decade, you had artists and designers, very non-technical people getting involved with 3D printing and teaching the nerds how to use the tools, right? Opening opening our minds to uh, more possibilities. So in that time period, you have um, really a push towards consumer 3D printing. That's really what the hype cycle is going to. This is the ultimate goal. We want printers in every household. We want them to be pumping out products that are used by the average person. And from 2015 into 2016, you start to see less interest in pop culture. You're not seeing it on the news all the time because people are entering into that phase in the hype cycle, which was the trough of disillusionment. Maybe. Or the plateau. Uh, Probably see. the plateau. Oh, the well, it was... It's the fall after the peak of inflated expectations. Yeah. It's the, okay. So 2015, 2016, we're now in the fall. Like, so 
all of the people who were investing in, in the stock market and speculating on what was going to happen with these companies, um, it starts to reflect in the stock prices. And if you look up the stock tickers, of, look up a, a 3D printing index like PRNT or DDD or SSYS, there's, those curves probably look pretty similar to that. I'll pull that up actually right now. It's probably going to be eerily similar. Give, because, me, one, give me one of them again. Uh, let's do DDD, 3D systems. All right. So if I look at this, um, it's the best way to get back to uh, look at Max. So since we're looking at DDD, I think 2015, 2016, this is when 3D Systems had that CubeX printer out, which is a consumer-oriented printer that just the market didn't, didn't want it. There were some roadblocks to the average person utilizing 3D printing, uh, 3D CAD skills being a big, big part of that. And that was a conversation I had with a lot of different analysts and investors who were trying to connect the dots in a way that would allow consumer 3D printing. And always that roadblock was people want it, I think, but they don't know how to create the parts. To print. All right. If I do a side by side, it's too bad we're not live on YouTube yeah. right now. <laughs> if I do a side by side comparison of these two, as I sit here and fumble over it, um, it looks eerily similar. So we do have a huge peak, absolute monster spike, right? In the stock price. In the stock price in 2014. Okay. Is when it absolutely just hammered a peak. And then as quick as it rose, so it rose starting in 2012, really started that steep climb. Um, something must have happened mid 2013. That's when it pretty much goes straight up mm -hmm. uh, and then drops pretty much straight down uh, <laughs> right after 2014 and then starts that slow decline almost to lower than where it started in 2012 uh, in 2016. So it hits a, a new low uh, then and then basically you hit the plateau. Yeah. At that point. And what's interesting is you have a lot of companies that formed in that hype period, you have Ultimaker, Formlabs, Mark Forge, of course, MakerBot. And these are companies that are still seeing some success. And, and you have some of the old guard as well, Stratasys being one of those that lived before it and lived on after that. And really, what came out of that wasn't as negative as the stock price alone would, would tell you because the printers that were coming out in that time period were selling. They just weren't selling to consumer. They were selling to guys like Tate who were in industry and wanted to use the printers for work. And especially the low cost printers that were primarily targeted towards consumers, they were easy for engineers to go out and buy and bring them into the office and learn how to utilize them in industry. So do you think more of the issue was with the everyday person, you know, not tech savvy or, you know, fin finance guy? He hears about 3D printing, whatever. Is he investing in 3D printing when he hears it's, it's for consumers, for uh, the everyday guy? Or do you think he's more excited when he hears it's for um, industrial use only? Well. Investors are speculating on growth and market size. And if you look at the consumer market size and some of the brands that sell to consumers, like Apple, mm -hmm. for example, their market cap is massive. Whereas companies that primarily sell B2B or in businesses, their market caps are going to be much smaller. And although they're, they can be very successful and very profitable businesses, investors are all about so what we're essentially saying is this peak that we saw, this peak of inflated expectation was due to investors seeing this is marketable to everyone. Yeah. This includes everybody. Right. Uh, just like an Apple yeah. iPhone or the iPod. Right. Like anyone can have. One. Right. And now, you know, we went through the plateau. If we are judging by stock prices, we went through the plateau of, of, 
of productivity or we're going through it. I, I don't know. What do you think? So what happened is the valuation of these companies contracted and you did see quite a bit of consolidation with the companies as well, some mergers and, and some players dropping out. And at the same time, you also had a huge influx of really entry-level systems. So you have one aspect of the market, which still exists today, which is sort of this, there's no innovation. It's just they're competing on price and really race to the bottom. And then you have companies who either from the very get-go were commercially focused or companies who pivoted from a consumer uh, target over to a commercial target. And those companies are the ones that are still surviving because there is a very clear ROI to many companies who use 3D printing. And that's what we've been kind of flushing out over the last few years. Is, okay, now that the noise has cleared, Let's actually sit down and discuss your manufacturing. Let's discuss your assembly process. Let's discuss your design methodologies. And let's find a way for this tool that is additive manufacturing to improve your work or to bring your products to market a little bit faster or to increase the reliability or to make your supply chain more agile. And that's what your and I conversations have looked like past few years yep right and stratasys has been really successful in targeting that market due to very robust suite of hardware great machines that look like they belong on a production floor but also a whole lineup of office friendly systems that real maybe would not even exist if we hadn't gone through that period beginning of the decade with the f-series yeah i mean you could you could consider that a pivot in yeah. some in some way. I mean, it's not like Stratasys is making these hobby level printers all of a sudden, but these are accessible. Uh, you know, they're they're good units, and I think people's understanding of reliability is, you know, they relate it to whatever they can. And and for a machinist, he's going to relate it to a CNC machine, or you know, someone who drives a semi truck is going to relate it to how many miles they can get out of out of their engine. Um, without a breakdown, and you know, I don't, I don't know if any of the listeners right now are thinking of something, or maybe just past experience with a three D printer, whether it's hobby level. But like, there's something to be said to Stratasys having been here for the long run because it is, it's a beast of a machine, and I can say that from my background, having dealt with some uh, other manufacturers that sold what I would compare to something that looks like an F-series type printer, um, something that's quote unquote office friendly and robust. And it's not, yeah, you know, so there's something to be said there for sure. I think it's easy to trace back their roots, which were all commercial oriented and see that shift, especially with the release of the F123 platform, as a admission, like, yeah, we were missing some things. Like they have the Fortis 250, for example, which was considered an office-friendly machine and we would run it in the office, but it didn't have user-friendly software, for example. And it didn't have some of these other aspects that other players in the market who were, who were entering the market as a consumer-oriented tool excelled at, like workflow, for example. Yep. And in the F123 platform, we saw some of those lessons learned integrate. And now that we have a few years to of data and a few years in retrospect, the F123 platform has been the best selling platform for Stratasys. It makes sense to me. I mean, if along my growth path, I have grown right along with my knowledge of 3D printing with, uh, you know, say a hobby level system and I've graduated into industrial. And now, you know, having worked with Go Engineer and, and having access to some of these machines, it's it, it was a must need in terms of filling that void um, and helping people graduate like I did from hobby level to industrial. So getting that ease of use in a package that didn't break down. 
because ultimately that's what people want. They don't they don't care whether you call it a hobby level system or right. industrial. Just like make it work, predictable. Yeah, and that's key when you are integrating a manufacturing tool or any tool into your business plan and your and your workflow. Like you have to know what to expect and then achieve that result. As long as it's realistic at the beginning of what to expect, then you can work around it. And if somebody was selling you a system that says 30% of the time, your part's not going to be the right shape or whatever, then you might be able to work around that. But if there are better options on the market, then, then maybe you don't bother. Yeah. And, you know, in terms of personnel, who do I have to hire to, to run this thing? Or can I use the guys I have or gals I have working with me currently? Uh, I mean, when you invest thousands of dollars in a machine, a lot of things we're used to take someone to run that. So you also have to consider their salary in, in making this thing work. But with these printers, it's there's definitely been a shift now. Anybody can use them. Sure. And that's definitely a hidden cost of, of doing business with, with some tools is what is your failure? What does it cost to recoup that failure? At what point or at what stage in the process is that failure happening, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there's no doubt about it. The industry in general has accepted 3D printing as a tool to stay. It took us several years of educating the general population about 3D printing and some years of experimenting with printers for uh, our user base to know and understand that fully. 3D printing is all about finding an application, proving out an ROI on that application, and integrating it into your workflow. So the companies that have succeeded were able to niche down. That essentially comes to niche down, either through materials or machines at certain price points and uh, finding those applications. Explain what you mean by niche down, just finding their you know, filling what void people need in the industry? Yeah, so niche down in the sense that selling a tool like a 3D printer, which is a tool that is highly touted for being able to do it all. Mm -hmm. Okay. But when you do something, when you try to do everything, typically you don't do everything as well as if you focused in on one aspect. And so... For example, every technology has its advantages and disadvantages. So you take a technology like Polyjet. Polyjet creates parts out of UV cured photopolymers. And those UV cured poly photopolymers do not behave mechanically like FDM thermoplast or SLS parts or SLA parts. And Polyjet has some unique aspects to it where if you fully take advantage of the technology, you can create multi-material prints, multi-color prints. Polyjet technology has been around for a lot longer than five years, but it's only in the last five years that we've really had color out of Polyjet. So they niched down and they said, instead of Polyjet being marketed to everybody, let's niche it down and let's specialize in what only we can. And in this case, it's multi-material printing and color printing, which those capabilities align well with the needs of say a market. Okay. Just wanted to make sure we flush that out, you know, for myself and maybe some other SolidWorks people who need that helps me out. Good deal. So that brings us to 2020. So there's your, there's your history lesson. There's your background. Hopefully that was helpful and interesting. And what was unique about this year is we had some good momentum on the 3d printing side and, and really the economy in general doing pretty well around the world. And then we start to see signs in January into February and then March, and we're in what the World Health Organization labels a pandemic on March 11th. And <laughs> <laughs> the date, <laughs> the, the date. And suddenly supply chains are in disarray, like total disruption. And it's global disruption. It's everybody. So if you're doing your due diligence and you're averting risk by having multiple suppliers in different 
parts of the world, it doesn't matter. It's affecting everybody. And demand for certain products is spiking, like toilet paper. <laughs> and demand for other products is plummeting. And so you have this dynamic in, in demand and also just production of these things is also in flux. And suddenly, everyone's watching the news. You, I'm probably not the only one that noticed 3D printing started to come up again in mainstream news. Did you notice that? Yeah, I did. I, uh, I had a few YouTube channels pop up on my homepage, um, people printing face masks. And uh, yeah, it, multiple stories on 3D printing face masks. Mm -hmm. It seemed like, yeah, it was exciting. For me, again, being relatively new to the industry, it's like, oh, there we are. Yeah. You know, so it's, right. it's fun. It, it was a weird time for us to be in this in industry with access to a lot of machines and not much to do other than ask, how, how can we help? Yeah. Uh, surreal, really. And I think we'll be looking back on that time period of March, April, May, for years to come to try to really figure out what went well, what didn't go well, and what could be done to avoid some of the catastrophe that we saw. The reason why 3D printing was coming up so often is because it was enabling guys like you and I and tens of thousands of other 3D printing users to basically mobilize and jump in and try to answer that question, how can we, through various, various different ways. And then you also saw a movement on the business side as well, because you have to think these businesses, perhaps their revenue stream has just been cut off. Perhaps their workforce has just been almost entirely eliminated and everyone needs to stay afloat. You're balancing that, the business needs, with also like the, the needs of humanity. We're all facing adversity and there are shortages. Safety equipment, PPE is, is in huge shortage. You just can't find it. So what do we do? And 3D printing shine because it's a very agile method of manufacturing. And you could be in full production in one day on one item, and then the next day completely shift over. And then the next day, maybe you shift again. And we had to do that with like even the face shields that we were printing. Well, we do that now. We, we do, do that now. We do it now with printing all kinds of different benchmarks for different companies. It's we're used to it. And that's that really hits on the importance of this discussion because those three months were really a great example of what's already happening just in a more broad, general, slowed down sense, right? Supply chains are still something that we deal with all the time. Design iterations are something we work around mm -hmm. all the time. Tooling and retooling and adjusting the cost and whatnot. Those are all realities. It's just we were hit with everything all at once. Yeah, I, I feel like we got a chance to show what we're really good at. And not only were businesses able to do it, but anybody who owned a 3D printer. And um, getting back to one of the videos that I saw, because I actually did click on one uh, on the YouTube homepage, I guess it, it did its job. <laughs> and I, this guy is just some dude who 3D prints occasionally. And he's like, totally empowered mm -hmm. and he's empowering some of his followers to hey this is what we're doing this is this is why it's good and maybe it as inspiring as it was hopefully it inspired others uh i felt inspired and i think we kind of inspired the world a little bit um with everyone's kind of jump to action and this guy uh, you know maybe it captured the imagination of investors again uh or just people in general and I wonder how much it has to do with still the hobby level movement on some level, but mm -hmm. as well as the industrial, you know, people like you and I who have access to these printers um, who can turn on a dime and change what we're doing. So I, I don't know. I find it brings up some interesting questions. It, it brings up a lot of questions. And one thing or a couple of things that I need to reflect on more are some of the the risks of jumping in and, and printing some of this equipment as well, because 3D printing, 
as I mentioned before, when you put it in the hands of a dress designer, they spit out something that a mechanical engineer is never going to dream of, right? But the same thing is you put a 3D printer in the hands of an accountant who, you know, <laughs> who bought a mono price machine and has it in his, in his basement and he's suddenly he's printing face shields and masks. Like you're treading in deep water there that there's some risks involved as well. Like one thing that we were really aware of is knowing how to use the tool correctly. And we focused in on printing face shields because we felt like that's really where the printer was going to excel and we weren't going to harm it by doing it. Certainly, if you were taking a 3D printed part and using it in a non-emergency situation, I don't know, like parts for a respirator, a part that was never sterilized, maybe not even designed correctly, and you're using it for a life critical component, that, that's scary. Yeah. That's scary. So you sure. have this, you have this situation where 3D printing is so enabled that it allows people to do things that maybe they shouldn't be doing. Like a gas pedal hinge on <laughs> <Like, laughs> <like> a Corvette. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly that. At least it's not a brake pedal hinge. <laughs> and that was one of the risks too. While we're sitting here trying to figure out what we're what we should do, we were trying to dance around some of the safety concerns. And unlike many of the people out there who were only hoping to help, we actually had access to known materials, even uh, materials that are known to be sterilizable, either through an autoclave or through other methods. And we had access to medical grade traceable yeah, materials as that's well. That's what I was just going to say. You can't trace something most likely that you bought on Amazon. Right. You can't. Yeah. They, they just don't have the certificates where we have these, you know, ISO 10993 certifiable materials. And we know the batch number. We know the lot number. We know the data manufacturer. We can trace it all. But even then, I was too concerned with safety to really embrace and there was a con there was a thing also the concern of what shapes are you printing, what parts are you printing, and what are their origins, right? Um, because do you really trust a, a ventilator design that was done by some person and then uploaded to the internet, <laughs> right? How do you? And that brought up that, that that's a topic that I want to research more. I was looking into it earlier, and I came across a paper written by a professor and he his argument i'm gonna i'm gonna find the name but his argument <laughs> was that we have a lot of funding through like the national uh, institute of health and there's other federal funding that goes into uh, these projects for medical devices and a lot of that funding gets lost to private corporations like that who who take that funding, build upon ideas, invest in the manufacturing, invest in the marketing, invest in the testing and the qualifications and stuff like that, but ultimately release a product that is protected by patents, which is fine. But when you are in a, a situation like this, an emergency situation, a pandemic and supplies are limited, like it was not a great position to be in as someone with access to manufacturing equipment and the means to create these shapes but legally being unable to do it. It was one of those conundrums that I never expected to be in. Well, luckily we had luckily we had a choice, you know, and people thinking, is this something we should do or shouldn't do? And yeah, uh, there is definitely uh, some responsibility there. And you did have some private companies open, open the doors to some of their design files. Um, so the professor that wrote this paper that I was reading, is, his name is Joshua Pierce. He's with the Michigan uh, Technological University. And it's called Distributed Manufacturing of Open Source Medical Hardware for Pandemics. And his effort was to research mm, these medical products in India that were partially funded by the government and trace them through to the market and how open those files were to the actual market later on and lessons to be learned from there. But Medtronic, one of our really good customers, is a good example of a private company that opened the door to their design files. So 3D CAD files, schematics, documentation, all of that for one of their ventilator designs so that people could pursue a known safe design. Yeah, that's 
to me, that's huge. Uh, companies do not like to give up IP mm-hmm. uh, at really any cost because it could be viewed as threatening if somebody else has it. And for someone to give access to that was very, very, uh, it's charitable. <laughs> charitable, the right word, or, or generous. And because it just doesn't happen. I mean, we deal with file transfers um, every day. People are sending us files and they're companies we work with and they're super, super sensitive. And I think it's fair to say we're both advocates for intellectual property protection. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's one of the reasons why 3D printing is an excellent choice because it helps protect your IP by keeping manufacturing close to you. Close right. To the team. Right. But in times of pandem- pandemic and emergency, then it is nice to see some people in the industry making decisions to, to open the door in for, for safety reasons. Sure. So we were pretty lucky, you know, having, having the benefit of these Stratasys systems, we were able to print about 3,000 face shields and we shipped them to Stratasys in cooperation with a program that they had going, which was a stopgap program. This touches on another important aspect of 3D printing, and that is it's great at low volume production. In yeah. fact, it's it's most efficient essentially at volume of one, just unit production. And there's a curve to follow to show the cost per unit. And generally it starts low and starts to increase 3D printing. Whereas a conventional manufacturing method like injection molding, cost per unit starts high and slopes down. You overlay those two curves, they meet at a certain volume, and that's sort of the, the point as at which you might switch. It's all based on volume. Yeah. Right. Yep. And Stratasys from the very get-go knew that injection molding was going to be the way to provide face shields uh, that are demanded by the healthcare facilities around the country. But it took them five weeks to get to the point where they could shoot plastic. So in the meantime, they called on their partners like us to print face shields. And we printed about 3,000 partners in general, printed close to around 100,000 face shields that were distributed throughout the U.S. But in a 12-week span, 3D printing covered about 100,000 in the first. Ultimately, 3D printing covered about 100,000. It was the only technology supplying these parts in the first five years. But if you look at the production curve, once those molds went online, then the face shield production went up. It outpaced 3D printing, even though we had a, a very wide distribution network. And that's just economies of scale. And it's what you get for that upfront investment of your tool. But the point there is that 3D printing is a great stopgap option for manufacturing. And sometimes you're only operating in stopgap. If you think of when you're in early production, you're in the prototyping, your volume is going to be low, right? Sure. And it's changing day to day. Hour to hour. Hour to hour. Yeah. And when you're in the middle of production, 3D printing may still have its place in meaning maybe peak demand because that's part of the supply chain calculation is what's your demand like? And you have to be able to accommodate low demand and high demand and fluctuating peak demand. 3D printing, because it doesn't have all of that upfront work and that upfront costs, it can also be used to meet peak demand or like um, aberrant demand, unexpected demand. You can quickly jump into production parts. Right. Even if it's not a production part, uh, that just got me thinking of of fixing things, you know? Yeah. Um, it's, if you want to talk about ROI, which I know that's not the direction we're going, but, uh, well, I guess it kind of is. Yeah. When, you, when you talk about things like injection molding versus 3D printing, which, shameless plug here, there's a blog post coming out here on the Go Engineers blog page where I'm going to talk a little bit about this. But yeah, having a 3D printer in-house, not just for those gaps in production, but say there's a part on your production line. Now your production stops. Not only can you produce potentially the parts if they're thermoplastic parts, uh, but if there's something else, maybe it's a print press or something, uh, you, you do ink printing. Well, this part that's 3D printed can get you back up and running faster than you could even, you know, make an Amazon order and have it shipped to you, uh, even with Prime. <laughs> so it, it it's one of those things. Is the end quality going to be as good? Um, sometimes better. 
sometimes worse, but, uh, but it's going to work yeah. for the intern. And that's, that's another valid phase of production. It's sort of that post-production phase in the aircraft world. They would call that MRO, but we hear about that all the time, like having to service machines that are way out of production, but still in use. The molds or the tooling for those parts are long gone. How do you service that? Like, it's pretty hard to do. And 3D printing enables that, especially more and more as we have a wider variety of materials, more technologies with polymers and, and, uh, and metals. You can hit all phases of that production. So we were printing face shields. There were some movements about face masks. Uh, and some companies doing design challenges to get people involved and in, in user input there, implementing off the shelf filter uh, material to implement into designs and things like that. Nasal swabs. Did you, did you hear about nasal swabs? I saw I saw a couple of things. Yeah, there was a huge shortage. Huge shortage. And and uh, we didn't do a lot of nasal swab stuff because for the most part, the Stratasys portfolio machines don't align completely with the high volume production of nasal swabs. The V650 the V Flex was involved in some uh, nasal swab production, but primarily these were being handled by other technologies because that's where their best fit was. What was interesting is once these 3D printing companies started to recognize that they could handle the nasal swabs, they shot into production quickly. And because of the technology, they aligned with higher volumes. So we're talking about like 10 to 100,000 nasal swabs a day. Suddenly, there was the, the production of 3D printed nasal swabs outpaced the testing reagents, the testing equipment, and also the number of trained users to actually do the tests. So early on, when nobody could get tests, it wasn't because there were no swabs for the tests. That's amazing. It outpaced everything. All additive. Is yeah. that right? Yeah. That's Additively incredible. manufactured nasal swabs. Sterilize them. Primarily done with like SLA. Uh, technology, so resin cure technology, and uh, I think HP did, did it as well with the binder jetting. That's incredible. Speaking of binder jetting, that is one person I sort of left out of my little history lesson because binder jetting came around in the 1980s as well. And there's a there's a team at MIT headed up by uh, Professor Ellie Sachs, and Ellie Sachs is one name that doesn't always get mentioned with those those first three, but I think it's important to name him too because the term 3D printer exists because of him. He coined that term, 3D printer, three-dimensional. Printer. Is he getting royalties? <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so. <laughs> if, if, if there's royalties going to anywhere, then it would be MIT, the institution. So that brings us to, I think, today where we can talk a little bit about some of the what's new that sure. we have. Uh, had the opportunity to get our hands on this year from Stratasys. There are some great things coming out in the next six months, I would say, from Stratasys. But uh, unlike the solvers guys, we're not going to tell you <laughs> until they're reality. There's no what ifs and and uh, what's to come. And the good thing is we have lots of cool things to talk about. You touched on probably one of my favorite, and that's the DAP, the digital anatomy printer. Yeah, so that printer is pretty cool. So what, what basically happened is Stratasys released uh, kind of an upgrade kit for an existing platform, the J750. They offered these new materials, um, which everybody who's worked even with a hobby level printer, there is some major tuning, if not new hardware involved in getting your printer to print a new material, whether it's FDM, Polyjet, doesn't matter. Uh, so Stratasys went, did all the homework, um, created these three new uh, materials that are built just to mimic human anatomy. So they have bone matrix, tissue matrix, and gel matrix materials, which, again, you've mentioned it before. It just, these new materials, even if it's on an existing technology, a brand new material now gives you access to a whole new industry, or it gives an industry that's already had access to this, more capability. So, you know, you go in a hospital, uh, anywhere they're developing um, these, I guess, uh, what would you call them, medical devices? Mm -hmm. If you go into a hospital, they're, they've got 
multiple print technologies. They've got uh, multiple brand names in there. They they don't care. They just want to create these widgets. And um, this is another tool for them to create new widgets that they may have been getting in other ways. Um, in, you know, like a, a glass, a glass uh, heart versus a heart made of tissue that actually feels like a heart and acts like a heart or uh, any of these vasculatures in the human body, um, they can now create with this printer. So if it's your favorite or one of your favorites, it's for good reason. Um, that printer is incredible. I think it's amazing. I started to better understand the medical device world once I s viewed them as sort of like car mechanics, oh, except for the yeah, human body. For sure. And designing aftermarket parts, but for the human body. Imagine if every car, every Ford Focus that came to you was different. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, it's a Ford Focus, but this one's different. This one, you know, its tires are, are odd sized or whatever. Like mm -hmm. that anatomy they have to create on a case by case basis. Uh, if not, at least they have to at least create a healthy version and maybe a symptomatic version of every right. model. So in the same way, it would be difficult to design aftermarket parts without having a base vehicle there. It's hard to design medical devices meant to interact with the human body without having good replica, especially mechanically comparable models. Yeah. You mentioned the heart and I mentioned Medtronic earlier. Medtronic worked with Stratasys, right? To validate sure. the, uh, the appropriateness of using DAP printed heart tissue uh, as compared to just organic myocardium tissue. Yeah. In other words, they just want to know if it's close enough to the real thing. Yeah. And they backed us and went ahead and said, hey, yeah, these these materials are good. Mm -hmm. And, you know, think of being a doctor and working with cadaver bodies. It's freaky. But aside <laughs> from it being freaky, you have a different tissue density or thickness or all these differentiations in this anatomy and you can't plan like if you're drilling bone for example to insert screws in a cadaver bone uh, i've been told by multiple people it's just so difficult to test with this because we get a thin bone then we get a thick one then we get a brittle one then we get uh, a more ductile one and this gives these guys the ability to print consistent models which they're excited about We've always taken that for granted, being on the mechanical side. You yeah. Just take for granted. Yeah. Uh, so that launched on the J750. It's the DAP version of the J750. The J750 is a six material polyjet print. At the same time, Stratasys released the J850, which is the next generation. And they added one extra material. So now you have seven materials that you're loading. And typically, we see like a cyan, yellow, magenta, black, white, clear, and agilis, which is a rubber-like material. How did that affect all the people who bought a 750, like a month before it came out? <laughs> there was an upgrade path. Okay. There was an upgrade okay. path, yeah, for sure. Just wanted everyone to know that. <laughs> we upgraded our machines. Yep. And we upgraded our machines. And it was awesome because um, in terms of workflow, it was, it eliminated one of the, the last, issues or disruptions in the workflow. And that was, do we have clear or do we have rubber-like? Because those are two materials that we like to mix with the other material. We like to do full color models and we like to make them transparent. Or we like to do full color models and we like to make them soft. And we had to choose one or the other. And with the J850, we didn't have to compromise it. So we can just have everything loaded and we can print a whole wide variety of parts on one build on. The V650 relaunched this year at the beginning of the year so it had come out before but stratasys relaunched it this year they changed the pricing and, and some of the aspects of the v650 flex which is a production oriented sla printer entero 840 cno3 was released which is the pec based thermoplastic that has some esd properties i pitched the idea of us building and launching a satellite <laughs> i haven't told anybody no. 
You heard it here first, folks. <laughs> if you lasted this long, <laughs> Tyler's going to print a satellite. Yeah, I, pit, I, I did all the research. It is a thing. You can. <laughs> of course you did. Yeah, you can launch satellites. The problem is you have to schedule a launch time in. Those are like 18, 24 months out and fairly expensive. So I'm still working on how to make it a reality. But we we do have the ability to create some awesome things that they deserve to go into space. Well, I hope this podcast is around long enough for people to, to witness this <laughs> thing. We'll, we will send a recording of this podcast up into space <laughs> and broadcast it out. Those The satellites, they're, they're have a decaying orbit so they only last like days into weeks into months and they eventually burn up gotcha even with antero even with antero yeah i think it's more of like a space clutter thing they don't want a bunch of satellites up in space okay i think so makes sense yeah i wouldn't want it no if it was my backyard well I'd clean that up yeah i don't really know what happens to it i assume it just burns up long before it reaches the ground we don't know. That's the worst part. <laughs> there could just be trash flying around up like there a, still. The difference, I think the difference between a meteor and a meteorite is one makes it to the ground, one does it, doesn't. So that's the difference between... Which a, is which? Well, that's the difference between a saddle and a satellite. <laughs> we're, so, we're making so, a satellite. Speaking of those new materials, <laughs> we you mentioned ESD safe in that. Uh, I'll just hurry and Throw in the, EA, the ABS ESD7, which is available on the F370 platform. Yeah. Which to me uh, is incredible because now we offer this great machine at super reasonable price and you have this additional material capability, which going back to again, new material capability gives you the option to do more with the machine and enter new venues. Um, having an ESD safe, people have been asking for it for a long time. And so to get that without having to pay for the material option is kind of new as well. So uh, pretty cool. Yeah, that 370 is has been improved every year since it was released. Um, and with the addition of like TPU and ABS ESD7 and Duran, yeah. the material that can be a replacement for Delrin. But not the same. It's not the same as Delrin. It's nylon, but it has the lubricity of Delrin. Yes, the lubricious nature <laughs> of Delrin. Uh, the last machine that was released, and probably the, the last thing we'll talk about is the J55. Yeah, so that's pretty incredible. Um, we got one here. We were one of the first companies to have one um, and actually start using it. Very exciting because when I first started working for Go Engineer, I had heard rumors about this printer that prints on a disc, and uh, I'm like, I had discussions with you yeah. about it early on, and yeah. we're like, it's never going to work. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that how will they do that? How will they jet the materials on some, you know, the inner diameter versus the exterior diameter? And lo and behold, here we are. We have one, and it works, and it works really well. Um, there's a few things that we we like about the machine. Um, it, it prints superb in gloss. That's one thing I think it does better than any other machine. You're not supposed to say that. I don't think. Are you? I don't know. He can say it. It's the gloss is incredible. It looks like you just hit it with some like a clear coat, like a spray can lacquer. Um, the other thing, it prints very crisp colors, which you know, printing on that round tray, people with a mechanical mind will wonder, you know, uh, how we're doing this. And it's because that tray is making multiple passes to print one layer. And we have very finite control of the material droplets uh, and being able to pass it around four times for the same layer gives you that ability. So the color crispness Regardless of it, whether it was printed on the inside of the tray, outside of the tray, orientation uh, has ex exceeded expectations. Yeah, that's clearly the best polyjet printer that's been released that is truly office friendly. It's designed for designers, design firms. And I'm excited to see where this platform goes. We're, we're going to get some enhancements to that platform. It's going to change things. I mean, we always say platform like 
when you talk about furniture or you know something that takes up space in your house, you don't call it a platform, but you it it has a legitimate footprint. You, maybe that's a more common term, but like this thing, when you talk about footprints, look at the footprint of any other industrial machine and compare a three D printer to it. Three D printers are already winning. Yeah, but this thing is tiny in in comparison to other printers and it's just such a nice package it's just really well thought out i agree with that and uh i'm excited for this next year yeah so did the world fall fall back in love with 3d printing i think they did and we'll see how long it lasts you know i think that people in our industry who are using 3d printers as part of their day-to-day -day business and are using them as tools to improve their work and their and their products. They never fell out of love. We'll see. The consumers, we'll see. We'll see. I think that there's a lot of lessons to be learned from this year. And trying to figure out a way around some of the challenges that we faced in terms of creating safe parts quickly, finding 3D CAD models, known and uh, verified 3D CAD models quickly but also enabling some of these companies that were primed and ready to go, alleviating some of the concern that they had about risks of helping and risks of getting involved, either through uh, different regulations or some more clear cut standards in additive manufacturing. Uh, I think it was a, a learning opportunity for the industry as well. So are we on the upswing? Headed to the plateau, or are we are we in the plateau, fixing the to peak again? We're getting back to that question. Where, yeah, where are we at in the hype cycle? Well, you want to say you're on the upswing, and the problem with being in the cycle is that you're in the cycle. You don't know where you are, and see. So well, the cycle is linear, so hopefully we're not. You know, it, hopefully it is cyclical and comes back around, and and things can change shape. And I think. The polymer side of business has a lot of momentum and a maturation of the technology. And having identified a lot of very verifiable and reliable applications really eases the pressure and allows us to explore and innovate. And I think we've, we've hit that point. We're going to see a lot more innovation than we have over the past year. And um, on the metal side, we're still trying to figure out which is going to be the best technology to go to market especially for parts that are not extremely high value parts, more along the lines of parts that we're doing today in polymers. I think there, there's a use case for metal technology there that we haven't found yet. And so, hey, once that hits, we might go through a whole nother hype cycle that's fueled by the metal technology. Well, I, I hope we do. I'm all ready to be it's hyped fun. up. Yeah. It's fun. Yeah, <laughs> totally. And the thing is, is like more the more people we get using the technology, we're seeing it with industries now. Like we just need a printer because we feel like we're falling behind. Have you heard anyone say that? I have. Mm -hmm. And so it's like as that's actually a good thing, you know, right. because they're gonna they want to use this technology as it's normalized. It's also getting into more hands, and the more hands and the more creative types are around this technology, uh, the more it's going to grow. And the more we have people saying, hey, you know, Stratasys, we'd be really grateful if you would make a material that could do this. Or we could get a lot more use out of this machine if it could do that. Or we would buy a machine of yours if we couldn't already do this with a machine that costs half as much. It drives everybody to compete and everybody to jump into new um, you know, uncomfortable situations, but situations where we're pushing the envelope. That's true. And competition's good. That's, yeah. that's why we have progressed so much over the last 10 years. And to Stratus's credit, they were able to build on that experience, innovate, basically stay ahead of the market on FDM and Polyjet. No other company is doing anything close to what they're doing in terms of hardware and, and materials. So it's a fun ride. I hope, I hope we do hit another we're cycle. <laughs> All right, everybody, if you made it this far, thank you. This is our first, quote, podcast. <laughs> we'll do better. Uh, me and Tyler were just talking about how they tend to get better. So uh, if you listen, if we ever have another one, it'll be twice as good as this one. <laughs> so appreciate it.
Thanks. Thanks.